Just under 100 years ago, this was one of the most controversial images in the entire universe, which is surprising because it kind of doesn't look like very much. It kind of just looks like a big, swirly, cloudy, spirally nebulosity. And in fact, that's exactly what it was known as. Uh, this picture is of the spiral nebula M51. That M stands for Messier, uh, named for a guy named Charles Messier, who was an astronomer in prior decades, who looked around and mapped out and cataloged all of these spirally, cloudy-looking things. Due to his efforts and a bunch of other people's efforts, actually thousands of these were known at the time. But what wasn't known was what the nature of these objects were. And there was a huge divide in the astronomical community about whether these were objects in our galaxy, in the Milky Way, the billions of stars that orbit together, of which the sun is one, or whether they were, as Immanuel Kant would have called them, island universes, galaxies in and of themselves that existed far away. And this was what led to a great, great debate in astronomy, represented by the two gentlemen you see here, Harlow Shapley and Hebert Curtis. Now, Shapley believed that these spiral nebulae were objects within our own Milky Way, and that the Milky Way made up the entire universe. And Curtis, on the other hand, believed them to be distant galaxies in and of themselves. But in order for that to be true, the distances that they would have to be at were completely unimaginable to people at the time. And so in 1920, these two debated each other, and it wasn't known whether the Milky Way was everything there was or not. The answer actually came just a couple of years later, when this gentleman here, Edwin Hubble, for whom the Hubble Space Telescope is named, made observations with one of the telescopes at Mount Wilson. Now, the first image that I showed you was taken with the Mount Wilson 60-inch diameter telescope. Hubble was able to use the 100-inch, just a slightly better telescope, and you can see him doing that here. Now, what Hubble was able to do was to look at what was then known as the Andromeda Nebula, or M31, another one of these nebulae that had an unknown nature, but with a slightly different piece of technology. Hubble noticed that, in fact, this was made of individual stars. And so within just a couple of years, we went from being just one of anything in the universe to being part of this archipelago of what we now believe to be literally trillions of galaxies, each one comprised of hundreds of billions of stars. And overnight, our understanding of the universe was completely transformed. Today, when we look at the Andromeda Nebula, now known as the Andromeda Galaxy, our nearest neighbor in space, it looks a lot more like this. And in fact, if we look at a recently published view of it that was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can zoom in and see this. Note that all the things that you see here that look like stars, for the most part, are stars in our own Milky Way, like a veil that we're looking through when we look out into the universe. It's the apparent graininess of this picture that are the individual stars of our neighboring galaxy itself. Now, what I work on is a new telescope project currently under construction in Chile that's the United States' flagship telescope for the next decade of US astronomy. It's known as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST. Now, previous telescopes like LSST are what we call survey telescopes. When I say that somebody is using a telescope, you probably picture something equivalent to what Edwin Hubble was doing. Someone, usually a guy alone on the top of a mountain, looking through a telescope with their eye. But modern telescopes, in addition to not just being used by men, are also robotic. They're usually survey telescopes that map the night sky whose data is used by many scientists for a variety of different purposes. And you're seeing some examples of that here, including uh, this image that's showing you the uh, eventual peak that LSST will be constructed on. Now, LSST's predecessor, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, mapped the entire night sky over the course of about 10 years. But LSST is different. It will actually map the night sky roughly every three nights or so for a decade. 
moving us out of the realm of still images and astronomy and into a massive cosmic movie. Now, the reason that we can do this is that LSST is not just incredibly big, but very efficient. So what you're seeing here is a render of the telescope itself. And if you look, there are little sort of uh, alien-looking people next to it. I assure you, this project is entirely run by humans, but there they are. So as opposed to a 60-inch or 100-inch diameter telescope like those first examples, the LSST's mirror is 27 feet across. And this entire structure that you see here can move and settle on a new patch of sky in about three seconds. So it can not only collect light so that we can see very deeply out into space, but it can collect a huge amount of data by tiling the entire night sky and doing it over and over again so that we can see how things change. So at the end of the survey, we'll have about 15 petabytes worth of data taken by the world's largest digital camera, a camera so incredibly high in resolution it would take 1,200 HD televisions to display a single image. And most notably, although cool technology is always fun to talk about, the data that LSST takes will actually be available, publicly available, immediately as soon as it's taken. So it will be available to the world itself. Now, part of the reason that LSST was so highly rated and became such a priority for United States science and then eventually became an international project is that it can do a variety of different things. By looking at how objects move, it can trace things in our solar system like comets and asteroids, including those that might threaten us by possibly impacting the Earth. It can also study stars like our sun and the planets in their context. And we can even map our own Milky Way galaxy, which is still challenging to know the shape and form of, given that we're inside of it on looking out at the universe around us. By mapping out how stars change and how they die, we can look at these cosmological explosions that help us map out not only the structure of the universe, but how elements get reprocessed and turned into heavier elements in the furnaces of stars. And by mapping out where each one of those island universes, what we now call galaxies, are, we can study the very structure of the universe itself, where every single point of light you see in this animation here is actually a galaxy comprised of hundreds of billions of stars. But with these observations, with all of this data, comes challenges. And it's not just challenges associated with managing or mining or manipulating that data. It's challenges in the way that we work, because just collecting data is not the same as making discoveries. And these bring together all kinds of challenges for how we associate with one another as human beings, the species on this planet that produces scientific knowledge. With LSST, I participate in two ways. One of these ways is that I'm what's called the science collaboration coordinator. That basically means that I'm a community manager for thousands of scientists across the globe that use LSST and will in the future. So you see a small sampling of us here. But really what is challenging about this role is that LSST is a telescope, sure, but it's also a community of people who can choose to use this telescope in a variety of different ways. And so it matters what we decide to actually do with the equipment that we build. There are different scientific implications for different choices of how we deploy the telescope and that affects different communities within astronomy differently. And that means that you have a very diverse, widely spread out community of people that all need to be heard, that need to work together. And this is a challenge that goes beyond just using teleconferencing software, to really be thinking how we work together to use the resources we have to make the greatest difference in our astronomical knowledge. The other thing that I do with LSST is that I'm the founding director of our Data Science Fellowship Program, a program for astronomy graduate students to learn data science or advanced computing skills. But really, again, this is less about just learning to code. You know, we've all heard in some way or another that we're supposed to learn to code nowadays. And in fact, if you want to learn to code, you can go online and teach yourself to do that. In fact, it may surprise you to learn that most astronomers uh, we don't get a whole lot of actual instruction in how we use computers. Most astronomers are self-taught. But when you come to the fact that we have a particularly new, exciting, and very sophisticated data set, 
that means that we have to be smarter and that we have to really know what we're doing and the underpinnings of it. But also, we need a community of students who don't just have these skills, but know how to communicate them and know how to build a community around them. And so we don't just lecture at our students. It's not just bringing people into a room to do the same thing that they could do by themselves. It's about teaching them to do peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, to teaching them to work together in groups, and to use the different skills that everybody brings. It's about bringing in a cohort of people who are diverse, who look like the world, because we have many challenging pro problems to solve ahead of us, and we need everybody there to do it. And that is mission critical. It's also about making a curriculum that's open and available on the web, and so that these students have, at a very early age, the experience that it's not enough for them to be skilled. They have to go back to their home departments and share it. When they write a program that does something that will make science more possible, they have to share that as well. Now, beyond the astronomical community, this is really changing how we think about how science is done. With open data, we've seen the incredible onset of citizen science, or programs where people who are not scientists professionally, any of you, for example, could go online to projects like the Zooniverse, which is developed in part at the Adler and also at the University of Oxford, and to learn, after taking a short tutorial, how to contribute to scientific research. Now, the Zooniverse hosts not only astronomical projects, but projects in a variety of different way, in kinds of science. And over the past several years, we've seen people who are not professional scientists doing things like discovering new kinds of galaxies or new planets around other stars, things that wouldn't be possible without them. And so we can look at that open data as a possibility for more people to participate in science as we know it and to contribute to that very human thing, the body of knowledge that science gives us. Furthermore, data can be a medium. I'm showing here an example from the artist Julie Freedom, Freedom, Freeman, who uses data as a medium to create these works of art. This in particular is based off of the user behavioral data from projects from the Zooniverse, specifically Galaxy Zoo. And from this, she creates this visualization of how people interact. You can also think about making this into d data visualizations that defy the way we've thought of them in the past, with here the artist Natalie Miebach, who makes, with traditional sculptural methods like basket weaving, 3D sculptures that are visualizations of data themselves, here about the change of seasons in the Antarctic. And we can even move beyond using data visualization into things that are less explored. For example, this piece I did myself with data from NASA's Kepler mission, which uses sonification, or the creation of sound, to help people have a primary experience with the data around us. Because certainly, the things that we're doing and building, they're really cool. I won't lie, LSST is an amazing piece of technology. And it's currently being constructed and will be on the sky at the beginning of the next decade. And that's awesome and really exciting. But as much as telescopes are about being pieces of machinery, they're also about groups of people, communities that form around the availability of data, either bringing it into reality or to using it once it's there and accessible for all. And so, in as much as this can transform our knowledge of the universe, what it really does is it transforms the way that we think about ourselves and the way we work. Thank you. <laughs>